friends, this is Tony Canyas, and today I want to talk to you about a framework that I came up with to deal with what I like to call the wait and be patient conundrum. So this is very much a career episode on how to handle what I like to call the wait and be patient conundrum. I've had a lot of career conversations in the last few years with a lot of young and successful insurance professionals who, who complain about the same frustration. I thought it was important to write this, this article and, and uh, record this video. Generally, they've been at the same company for a while and they have grown into kind of middle-level individual contributor roles. And they have now been in their role between two and four years. They're already followed a lot of, of my usual entry-level insurance nerds advice and it, it has paid off and, and they've successfully grown into more interesting and better paid roles. Now, they're doing well in their position, they're enjoying it, they wanna to grow to the next level. Whether the next level is a manager type role or whether it's more of a senior level, independent contributor, consultant type role, when they get to, to their yearly review and they meet with their, with their leadership, they ask, what else should I be doing to grow into the kind of job that I wanna grow into? They keep getting the same answer time after time. Keep doing what you're doing, be patient. Keep doing what you're doing, be patient, and no actual constructive feedback. So for prior generations, and in this case, I mean boomers and somewhat Gen Xers, but especially boomers, they were playing a different game. Boomers especially were playing a different game where lifetime employment was pretty much guaranteed and putting in your time at a, at a specific company was simply a necessary part of the, of the process. The company, the deal was that the company would take care of you and manage your career. You put in your time, you, you did your job well, eventually you, you grew. But for millennials and for the younger half of Gen, of Gen Xers and for Gen Zers, we're playing a different game. Lifetime employment is dead and uh, managing your own career is up to you. That's why you read insurance nerds. And the taboo on changing jobs has largely evaporated especially in the face of 1% unemployment within insurance and a brutal war for insurance talent. Combined with easy visibility provided by LinkedIn, it means that you're likely getting weekly calls for opportunities at other companies, sometimes at a 20 to 40% raise. Now, this article was written prior to COVID, but even during the COVID recession, insurance has held really well and unemployment ticked up to about 4% and it started to come down. So this, this remains very true. It's a delicate situation. If you play your cards wrong, you could end up in a worse situation by leaving a company where you had a lot of capital already built. Or on the other hand, if you play your cards wrong, you could end up staying in a place where you're no longer growing, which is the worst thing you can do for your career, especially while you're in the early years of your career, you should be seeing a lot of growth. So here's my framework to think through this situation. Question number one. Are you still learning and growing? Other than your ability to pay the bills, the most important thing that you gain from any role in the first half of your career is continued learning. If you're still learning on the job after you've been there for a couple of years, it's probably worth sticking around. You're becoming more valuable for future roles by everything that, that you're learning and all the experience that you're getting. If you're no longer learning, then you're going to grow bored and disengaged. And worst of all, you're, if you're not learning, you're not growing, your skills are stagnating. And so is your value in the talent market. Number two question to, to consider, are you getting paid fairly compared to your value in the talent market? During a talent war, which insurance is in, it's almost inevitable that those staying at the same employer and especially in the same position, same department for longer than a couple of years will see their income grow slower than those who move around every couple of years and, and negotiate well on every job change. We'll have a, a video on negotiating salary. Take some time to re research the market using sa uh, sites like Glassdoor, like salary.com, like paycheck.com, and also keep yourself fresh by doing a little applying and interviewing for roles and get a real feel for the kind of pay ranges that are being offered for your skill set, what your worth is on the market. It's important to understand that whenever you change companies, part of the reason the new company is willing to pay you a higher salary is that you will go through the pain of losing the political capital you have already built at the, at the prior employer. Part of the reason that they have to pay you a higher wage in order to, for, for you to leave it is that. You know how to get things done at your company and, and you're known for getting things done at, at your company. You have political capital within, within the company that helps you get things done. When you get to a, to a new company, you have to rebuild that from scratch. And that is a painful process. You have to learn a whole new corporate culture and you have to rebuild a whole new internal network in order to be, to be productive and get things done. And those things take a lot of work and thus warrant a, a higher salary. Number three, do you have a good manager? People don't quit companies, people quit managers. If you have a great manager right now and you really jive with, with that manager and they're investing in your growth, be very careful about giving that up because it's very hard to know upfront 
what kind of manager you'll end up with at a different company or, or, or department. On the other hand, if you have a really crappy manager, that might be enough on its own to warrant a move, even if most other things about your current role are, are good. Number four, do you have a credible growth path? Are your manager and the rest of your leadership team making it clear what your potential career paths might look like in the future after the wait and be patient phase? Are they giving you a clear path and clear advice on the things that you need to achieve to pursue those options along with an acceptable timeline? If yes, then there's a strong reason. That's a strong reason to be patient. If you don't believe them or if they're not giving you clear answers, to your questions, especially after you ask over and over and over about where you can go next internally, then you might want to consider moving on. Number five, do you have good internal mentors? You should have both internal and external mentors. And if you have a great relationship with, with your internal mentors and you are convinced that they're invested in your growth, that is a very valuable thing. It'll be difficult to build strong mentoring relationships in your next company. So that is a reason to, to stick around. Number six, do you have an executive sponsor? An executive sponsor is different from a mentor. An executive sponsor is someone high up in the company who is committed to, to finding new opportunities, backing you when you're being considered for a stretch assignment. It's a huge plus to have a, a, an executive sponsor. If you don't have an executive sponsor, that's not a huge negative. It's kind of a neutral. Most of us probably don't. And finally, question number seven, are you trying to get your first people leader slash manager role? Making the move from being an individual contributor to a people leader slash manager is a special case scenario because most companies are uncomfortable with moving someone from an individual contributor role in one company directly into a manager role in another company. This point deserves its own article or its own, its own video, but for now, I'll summarize it this way. If your number one goal is for your next move to be into a management role, then you need to carefully assess whether you are seen at your current company as one that is on a path to become a manager, manager material, right? I'd like to move us right along to a Peter Gibbons. Now, we had a chance to meet this young man, and boy, that's just a straight shooter with upper management written all over him. Ooh, yeah. Um... Or whether there is something in your way. If you're fairly sure that your company sees you as manager material or management potential, then you probably don't want to change companies right now. You're much better off concentrating on getting that first manager role within your company, doing that for a year, and then moving to another company with that manager title in your title. This is likely to be much easier than convincing another company to make you a manager right away after you've never led a team. Once you've answered those seven questions that can help you uh, make a decision, I can help you through it at chatbitoni.com. And we also have a companion quiz to go with, with this video and this article, I'll include the, the link below. That quiz can give you an idea of what to do about the very common wait and be patient conundrum. Thank you.